to start out with this, uh, and I'm going to go kind of fast because I, I want to get this finished in 30 minutes if I can. This is from an absolutely terrible, terrible paper. And it's about 17 pages long, and there are lots of sentences in there. And uh, the law of averages would, would sort of militate that there's at least one sentence in this whole paper that's correct, and this is it. <laughs> I went in and got it out. And this is no, nothing strange to all of you in this room, but it is strange to a lot of people at medical conference where I give this talk. But it says our physiology should be optimized to the diet that we've experienced during our evolutionary past. As I say, that's no joke to, or, or, or nothing new to anybody in here. Now, <coughs> here's a, another book. This is by a guy named Blake Donaldson, and this is a book that is not for the politically correct. Let me tell you that. This was written back in the 60s. Blake Donaldson is an old doctor from New York that actually knew Stefanson and, uh, and sort of accepted Stefanson's ideas of diet. And if you went into to Dr. Donaldson's office in New York City, you ended up, it didn't matter what you had. If you had heart disease, you went on an all-meat diet. If you had <laughs> diabetes, you went on an all-meat diet. If you, had, uh, if you were overweight, you went on an all-meat diet. And he is totally unpolitically correct. And it's amazing because this is a mainstream published book. I think it's Doubleday back in the, in the early 60s. And you can see what got published back then that absolutely would never get published today. Uh, but anyway, uh, Donaldson, based on his time with Stefanson, said, uh, he cut to the quick better than that other paper did, during the millions of years that our ancestors lived by hunting, every weakling who could not maintain perfect health on fresh fat, meat, and water was bred out. And so that pretty much says it all. Now, if you look at, at uh, our, our years of humanity, and I got this from, from Lauren Cordain, and you know, there's a saying that if you, if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a whole lot of people, it's research. So I've done a lot of research. <laughs> and this is one from my good friend Lauren Cordain that just shows how many generations that we have been eating crap, which is very few. So we've had very little time to adapt and how many generations we've been eating the ancestral diet and why it's no surprise to any of this, us in the know that people do so much better when we shift over into an ancestral diet. But you know, the big question that you have or that everybody should have is what's the ancestral diet? Because you ask 20 people, you get 20 different answers. And what this talk is about is ways that we can determine what the ancestral diet is. Now, this says 99.6 of all homo generations had no evolutionary experience with commonly consumed modern foods introduced during the Neolithic. Now I want to talk, I want to start out because there are four ways that we can use to determine what the ancestral diet should be. And one of these is, it's not really a way of determining it, but this is a paper that I love that's a thought experiment that uh, Leslie Aiello and Peter Wheeler did. And I talked to Leslie Aiello about this. This was published in Current Anthropology. She had a hell of a time getting it published because they thought it was going to be too controversial, and it ended up being the most cited paper in, in the history of the journal. So they're probably glad they published it. But this is, a, as I say, a thought experiment. And it's, it starts off based on the work of a guy named Max Kleiber, who was an old physiologist uh, who's long gone now, but, but uh, taught for years at the University of California at Davis. And he uh, wrote this book called The Fire of Life because he was really interested in sort of the relationship between metabolism, metabolic rate, and body mass. And he came up with uh, what he calls Kleiber's Law. And this is actually from whatever this is, the 1947 uh, Journal of Physiologic Reviews. And that's, uh, that shows you the difference between journals now. I mean, journals now are all in color. And back then, graphs had to be hand-drawn. So that shows you the change in technology. But anyway, what Kleiber came up with was this line that you can see right there that's actually called Kleiber's line. And what that does is that relates, that's, that's based on an equation that relates body weight to um, basically metabolic rate. And virtually every animal falls on that line. There are a few outliers, weasels, if you can believe it, don't fall into that line. Some bats don't fall into that line. But pretty much everything else, from horses to elephants to humans to mice, fall on that line. And so he called that sort of the metabolic constraints that you couldn't really, uh, in other words, if, 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 if your weight went up, your metabolism went up. If your metabolism went down, your weight kind of had to go down. And what Aelo and Wheeler, who wrote this paper, did is they took Kleiber's law and they figured out, I mean, he already knew this, but human males and females fit right on this line. 
But Elon Wheeler took this law and said, okay, let's imagine a primate, uh, an early one of our early ancestors back from 300,000 years ago or 2 million years ago. That's gonna be a primate that weighs, a primate like that weighs 65 kilos, let's say, because primates fall right on this line too. And let's say it weighs 65 kilos, and we know on a 65 kilo primate that we have today, this is the relationship between, uh, this, this is what they've got. This is what their, their metabolism, uh, or what produces their metabolism. That's how much attributed to the brain. This is the gut, this is the liver, kidneys, and heart. And so what, what happens, what do we do if we see, that's what a 65 kilogram paleo person should look like too from you know, 300,000 years ago. What they find out when they look at humans, that it's not like that at all. You have all this energy that's thrown off by the brain. The brain has nine times, produces nine times the metabolic rate uh, as the, uh, on a per mass basis as the body does as a whole. So the brain chews up a huge amount of your metabolism. The liver stays about the same, kidneys and heart. And what gives way is the gut in order to stay on Kleiber's line. So what happened in our evolutionary past is that we traded guts for brains. Our brains got bigger our guts got smaller. Well, how could our guts get smaller? Our guts can only get smaller by increasing the nutrient density of the diet and making it easier to absorb, to digest and absorb. Now, if you look at, uh, again, if you look at uh, brain size versus gut size in, in primates, you can see this line going here, here are humans, I think this is, yeah, here are humans way over in the corner. You can see that our, uh, that our brain to gut size is way out there on the extreme. If you look at it just morphologically, uh, what our, our chest cavities look like. This is a chimpanzee. You can see how chimpanzees had, if you kind of follow that line down, they had great big bellies. This is an Australopithecus afarensis. That's Lucy, was, uh, was an A afarensis. And this is a human. You can see a, a tremor waistline. So you can even see it in the, in the skeletal structures. And here's just some more of those. If you look at it in actual, there's a gorilla. This is, a, uh, this is a chimpanzee, you can again, you can see the big bellies and they've actually got pretty small brains. And here's an actual hunter-gatherer. This is an Inuit from Greenland, uh, a Norwegian physician went over there and did a dissertation back in the late 30s and he wanted to find some remote place in Greenland that had actual um, pre-contact, basically, Inuit living a traditional lifestyle and, and this is what they look like. This is what a hunter-gatherer looks like. And he took photographs of a whole range of them and this is a pretty typical one, a 25-year-old male. So that's what a, a real live human hunter looks like, is built like. And you can see the narrow waist as compared to the chimpanzees and the gorillas. Now, why? How did that come from? Don't tell me. All this worked perfectly when I tested it. Maybe I'm just a moron, maybe up. Oh no, I don't want this, anyway, sorry about that. The, the reason that they had big bellies, this is right where it should be. I'm just not right where I should be. This, uh, this shows in today's, you know, sort of GMO, Luther Burbankized fruits and vegetables, this shows how much weight it takes to provide 3,000 calories a day for a diet. So if you're on a diet mainly of fruits and vegetables, you gotta have a pretty big gut to deal with all that. And that's, as I say, that's today's that are much more nutritionally dense. Back in the old days, go out in the woods and find some crab apples or something that are growing wild and see how many of those it takes to get you 3,000 calories. And that's what our primitive ancestors had. And that's what chimpanzees have and gorillas have. And so you can see why they have to have the large guts to process that. Well, humans ended up getting around that because we switched to eating meat. We switched to becoming hunters. And you can kind of see where that happened because this is, this is our development along here. Right about the time this took place, you can see this huge uh, increase in brain size that uh, the humans had, and that's us, you know, way up at the top. And people used to think that, uh, I mean, you had a lot of papers back before this uh, Aiello and Wheeler talk where people said, well, we grew these brains because we became omnivores and we had to uh, search out a wider range of foods. We, we lived in the savannas. We had to know more places that we could go to. You know, we were nomadic and therefore we had to develop bigger brains. It doesn't really matter. You had some, something had to give, no matter what the selection pressure was, to cause us to have bigger brains, something had to give and what gave was the gut. And the reason the gut could give is because we switched to eating meat, to hunting primarily.
So, as I like to say, we didn't evolve to eat meat, we evolved because we ate meat. And uh, Lear Keith, who wrote this great book called The Vegetarian Myth, who was a long time vegetarian, put it much more eloquently than I did. The wild herds of oryx and horses invented us out of their bodies, their nutrient dense tissues, gestating the human brain. And uh, now we're going to completely switch gears to another way. I mean, that is a thought experiment. That thought experiment, experiment to me at least, is pretty clear that something had to happen to get our big brains and what it gave was the gut. And the only way the gut could give is to increase the, the dietary quality, which we did by becoming hunters. Now I'm going to talk about stable isotope analysis, which is a really accurate way of determining what we ate in the past. That's a mass spectrometer. And I'm not going to go through all the biochemistry of this because it's boring, but basically uh, atoms have different numbers of, of uh, they have the, the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons, and that makes them isotopes. I mean, carbon's the same thing, whether it's 12, 13, 14. That's just the different numbers of, of uh, neutrons that are in there, but these differences can be detected by a mass spectrometer. And this is just a list of different stable isotopes. And stable isotopes hang around for a long time, and they don't change over the millennia. Carbon-14, as we see here, doesn't, uh, is not stable. It degrades, and that's why we use carbon-14 to do carbon dating that you've all heard about. So uh, 12C, 13C, those are, those are stable. Uh, here's 14, that's not stable. That's the one we use for carbon dating. Uh, nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15 are stable. Okay, so uh, they're stable. There's been no real change with them over geologic time. And there's a, the ratio differs between these two carbons uh, depending on what whoever owned that carbon ate. So when a sample goes to the mass spec, it determines this C13 to C12 ratio, and that's co compared to a standard, and it's called the delta 13, uh, where carbon's concerned. Okay, so what does it all mean? So C13 is found in greater, this is, this is one thing, C13 is found in greater quantities in marine mammals than in terrestrial animals. And so a, 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 a delta 13 indicates a diet higher in seafood. And what you find out when you look back over time in Europe, for example, is that C13 got larger, which means that all these hunter-gatherers back then who were excellent hunters and went after these large terrestrial animals, hunted them to an extinction. So over time, they had to, to rely more on, on fish and mollusks and snails and other things that gave them a larger C13 content. So we know from that that these animals were hunted to extinction. I mean, we know it because they're extinct anyway, but you can see it in the record, in the stable isotope analysis record. Ah, what did I do? Sorry. Now, and you can even see it in, in, in these, in the, C, uh, the C3 C and C4 plants because there's a different photosynthetic process that gives them a different ratio. And what's really interesting is you can see over here, these are all the vegetables on the left-hand side. These are vegetables and these are even wheat. And, and these are the C3 plants. If you go over to here, you get the C4 plants, which are primarily maize. And this is over time. And this is actually a study in the United States. And you can see early on, that, um, wait a minute, wrong study. You can see early on that everything was all C3. And then once they figured out how to grow corn, whap, there it went. And you see that a lot today because people eat corn sweeteners, they eat a lot of corn products. So you see this same picture in people alive today. I mean, you know, us, not us in this room, but typical modern humans, you would see that. We in this room don't eat corn products, so we don't have the, so, uh, uh, the delta-15 for nitrogen really tells a story, though, because plants contain a fairly constant nitrogen-15. And when herbivores eat plants, they concentrate the nitrogen-15 by about 5 to 8 percent in their collagen. So if a collagen contains a level greater than 7 to 8 percent, then the local flora, you know it's an herbivore because they've concentrated that by eating the local flora. If, and, and it's the same way, you can just see this is, this is for fish, so you can see that little fish eat plankton and, and bigger fish eat those and bigger fish eat those and it goes right up the way. And so this carbon, I mean this nitrogen 15 is concentrated as you go higher up the food chain. So you can tell by the nitrogen 15 what an animal 
has, has eaten basically in terms of, uh, of meat. Now here are some early hunters hunting this animal. Who knows what this is? Anybody know what this is? Hey, who said that? A glyptodon, yeah. These were hunted to extinction. These were in Northern South America, up through Central America and Mexico, and probably up into the Southern parts of the United States. They're about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, and they're herbivores. They were apparently pretty tasty because they were hunted to extinction by early man in pretty short order. So early man, and, and just in case you don't believe these exist, there's a picture of one in a museum and there's a skull. Um, but anyway, early man was, was a real hunter. Now let's look at what the stable isotope analysis uh, tells us about Neanderthals. If you look at the Neanderthal, these are all herbivores down here. Here's a fox, okay, and a wolf in the blue, and these are Neanderthals. So Neanderthal were high-level carnivores, just like foxes and wolves. Now what you can't tell about this is how much carb they ate, because it doesn't really show up. What this is talking about is, is eating other animals. Now we can say, okay, they ate a lot of other animals, and they ate a lot of carbs too. And we can't make the argument that they didn't eat carbs, but when they're at the same level as a fox and a wolf, and a fox and wolf don't eat a lot of carbs, so you can say they, that er, uh, Neanderthals probably didn't either. And so when they did this study, they were looking to see if uh, um, they were presumably omnivores, but they actually behaved as carnivore with animal protein being the main source of dietary protein. Now let's look at early modern humans. These are about 12,000 years before now. These are people just like you and me people just like us, anatomically modern humans. And what do you see? Well, those, you see the same thing. These are the herbivores down here. Here's a fox. Look at this, modern humans were even higher. And what that tells you is that these people actually ate other carnivores. They didn't just eat herbivores, they ate carnivores too and concentrated that. And that's why they're so much higher. So stable isotope analysis is now being used for everything to track migration patterns and everything else. It's really a fabulous way of, of doing these analyses. And this is what it shows that early modern humans ate. Basically, again, they were testing this hypothesis. Okay, now this is another way, another of the ways that you can tell what people ate is you can, you can look at the difference between human remains from a long time ago. And if you know what, what the, those people ate, which you can tell by um, the stuff they find where these people settled, uh, you can make some determinations about food versus health. And, and a, an anthropologist can tell almost at a glance at a set of skeletal remains, they don't call them skeletons, they call them skeletal remains. But anyway, can t at a glance at skeletal remains can tell if it was a farmer or a hunter-gatherer because hunter-gatherers were big, they were strong, they had good bones, uh, they had perfect teeth, the farmers, it all went to crap. They're, they had cavities in their teeth, their bones were smaller, their height was shorter. I mean, it's really easy to tell by somebody that's trained in doing this. But a lot of people say, well, yeah, but you know, farmers got disease because they were all living in cities and they were crammed close together. And so they, uh, it, it's logical that they're gonna have disease and they're gonna have beat down immune systems and they're not gonna grow as much and blah, blah, blah. And the reason that I like this study is because, which was done by the Smithsonian, is because this is one of the very few studies that, that compared a group of people who were hunters yet were not nomadic with agriculturalists that were obviously not nomadic. Now these were two societies with different means of subsistence. Uh, the skeletal remains were what were studied, uh, had a pretty good chunk of them. They lived in Western Kentucky. The hunters did 30, in 3500 BC, so that's about 5500 years ago. The farmers lived in, in Eastern Kentucky, uh, what, 1,000 years ago, uh, 1,500 years, what is, not 3,000, yet about, what is that, 500 years ago, okay? So there's essentially a long time difference between those two groups. And they're both pre-contact, probably the same genetic material, and, but this is the important thing, both groups were non-nomadic, so you can't use the argument that the fact that the agriculturalists were non-nomadic and the hunters were led to the bad health of the agriculturalists. And the hunter-gatherers ate basically a low-carbohydrate diet. You can read all the stuff that they ate there. Uh, the, uh, the agriculturalists ate primarily corn, beans, pumpkin. They gathered some wild plants and they supplemented it with an occasional deer, elk, or turkey. And corn was the weaning food for young children. 
And if you look at the skeletal remains, here's some of the things you can find. If you see this kind of moth-eaten looking, holy, grungy looking thing on the skull, uh, that's called parotid hyperostosis, and that is a, a sign of vitamin B12 deficiency, of iron deficiency anemia. If you look at this, you know, grungy, moth-eaten thing inside the eye, that's called cribro orbitalia, and that's, uh, and, and oh, and the top one, these are both very commonly found in, uh, in people in agrarian lifestyles. And in this group of, of study subjects, 50% of children under five years old and farmers had this. And this is really painful. And I, mean, I just really feel bad for these kids because this is really painful. And none of them were in hunters. If you look at this, this is called enamel hypoplasia. And you can see the lack of development of the teeth, these, these bands across the teeth. That comes from severe nutritional stress. That was a time that people didn't really have anything to eat at all, and they didn't lay down enamel properly on their teeth. And this is a common sign, again, in agrarian societies. And it's vastly more prevalent among farmers. Now, this is interesting because these are called Harris lines. And these are these lines that you can see in, in uh, radiograph in, in x-rays that are right here. And those represent fairly mild nutritional stresses. And those are actually much more common among hunters because if hunters got nutritionally stressed, which they did, they would move. In this case, these, these people got a little bit of nutritionally stressed, but they ranged out, I guess, and hunted. Who knows? But these are much more common in hunters than they are agriculturalists. So the agriculturalists have signs of severe nutritional stress. The hunters have more signs of, of uh, kind of minimal nutritional stress. If you look at teeth, tooth decay rampant among farmers, absolutely rampant. Average of seven caries per mouth, tooth loss in children, under one cavity in the hunter population. Some tooth loss in old age, secondary wear. And this is, this is kind of signs of inflammation that you can find on some of the long bones. Uh, it's called a periosteus. To, it's a, it's a syndrome of periosteal inflammation. Nobody really knows what it is. They suspect it's yaws, which is kind of a treponemal disease. Nobody really knows for sure, but you find this in a lot in immunosuppressed people, basically agrarians in the past. Uh, if you look at the other findings from this study, the life expectancy was lower among farmers, infant mortality higher among farmers. These are all common things that you find in agrarian societies. More farmer children infected than hunters. And the conclusion of, of the author of the paper was overall the agricultural hardened villagers were clearly less healthy than the Indian knollers who lived by hunting and gathering. Now, if you look at, at this, this is another thing that you find. I'm just going through some things that you can find about diet and skeletal remains. You see this plaque. Uh, that's really common among uh, agriculturalists and not present at all in hunters. It's, it's not uncommon to observe dental calculus in excess of 100 milligram in archaeological assemblages of agricultural populations. And, um, you know, S. mutans wasn't even around until about 10,000 years ago when people started farming and eating agricultural products. Now, here's an interesting thing, and I really like this. This is a fairly recent paper. And this is the, the horrific looking mouth of somebody that lived about uh, 12, 14,000 years ago. So this was kind of an intermediate between hunting and gathering and actual agriculture. And this was a nomadic society that was in the northern part of Morocco that ate basically acorns. And this, as we'll see, this is an atlas of an ugly mouth. And, and most of the subjects in this study uh, had mouths just like that. They lived in a cave. And that's basically what they ate at acorns, and they ate them raw, primarily. And you can see this is a list of, of what they ate, but the, the preponderance of it was acorns. They've got wheat down here just for comparison. They didn't really eat wheat. And so they gathered all this stuff, and they ate it. And you can see basically what it did to the mouth. And if you look at this, you've got uh, you know, heavy tooth wear over there by A. You've got contact carries. You can see that where the two teeth are in contact right in between there. You've got C, these are evulsions, which are interesting because evulsions mean they were forcibly pulled out. Uh, attrition carries, they used their teeth for stuff and broke them down and they got infected. Gross carries, that's an ugly thing. And then this down here is, uh, is an actual uh, uh, tooth abscess, which is horrifically painful and probably killed this guy. So, 
The adoption of agriculture, supposedly our most decisive step toward a better life, says Jared Diamond, was in many ways a catastrophe which we, which, from which we may have never recovered. Now I want to get on to this. I'm getting the signs. I'm going to hurry through. Th this is another data source, which is the ancient Egyptian diet. And the ancient Egyptian diet is interesting because it was primarily wheat-based. And it was actually what any, any modern nutritionist today, other than the ones in this room, would call a modern nutritionist nirvana. They, uh, they ate mainly bread. Uh, if you go to any kind of Egyptian exhibit, you're going to OD on these little figurines. I took these at the, at the Louvre a couple of years ago when they had a big Egyptian exhibit. So you're going to OD on them too watching this. But the, uh, uh, they just a million figurines making bread. Bread was a staple of the early Egyptian diet. And they, it was coarse ground whole wheat bread. And not only was it coarse ground, they put sand in it to help with the grinding process. And then they tried to sift the sand out because the sand helped it, but the sand got left in there. And people actually, there are advertisements from back then saying, don't eat Joe's bread, it's got too much sand. Eat mine, it has no sand. So that was part of the problem is you're gonna see the characteristic look of the Egyptian mouth, which got ground down by the sand in the bread. And so it was typically emmer wheat, which is the kind of wheat we would be encouraged to eat today if we were gonna eat wheat. Um, the um, bread, these are just quotes from, from books on this. The, the soldiers were rationed four pounds a day of bread. Now, now Egyptians did have other foods. They, they netted waterfowl along the Nile. They, uh, they fished, uh, they, but mainly they grew wheat. And their diet was primarily carbohydrates, bread, fruits, vegetables, honey, mainly bread, oils, flaxseed, safflower, fish, and occasional red meat. And they got their red meat basically from animals uh, that they used for, they were much too valuable as, as labor animals uh, than they were to eat. But they ultimately got old and died, and so that's when they got their red meat. So Egyptians, uh, <coughs> rush through this. Uh, so anyway, what do you see when you look at the ancient Egyptians? Uh, their pictures are like pictures you would see in better homes and gardens. Everybody's thin and all that, the, their hieroglyphics. But their statuary kind of tells a different story. And you can see in the statuary that it's much more accurate a reflection of what they really look like. And they were fat. And look at these guys. These guys all have boobs, okay? And that's from the phytoestrogen and all this wheat that they ate. So that's the typical picture of males. This is a, a female. Couldn't find very many pictures of female statuary. Uh, this guy, look at that belly he's sporting, bellies and boobs. And I mean, he's proud of it. And another one. And if you look at Egyptian statuary, this is what you see all the time, bellies and boobs, bellies and boobs on males. So, uh, they, but, but aside from the statuary, there is this whole database of Egyptian mummies. It's said that there are as many mummies as there are people living in Egypt today. And so this, so you've actually got soft tissue, unlike the other study that we looked at that had, uh, that had just skeletal remains. Here you've got soft tissues, and there's a ton of stuff. And this guy named Sir Mark Armand Rufer is the first pathologist that actually looked at stuff under the microscope, and he developed this solution to hydrate mummy tissue, which is still used today. It's called rougher solution. And this was back in the, uh, oh man, I'm really getting the sign now. This was back in the early 1900s. And this is pictures of heart disease in ancient Egyptian mummies. And this is what he said. I cannot therefore at present give any reason why arterial disease should have been so prevalent in ancient Egypt. I think, however, that it's interesting to find that it was common and that 3,000 years ago it represented the same anatomical characteristics as it does now. So they had, they had a, a, a diet that um, every nutritionist would give us today to have us prevent heart disease, and they were eaten up with heart disease. And even in the Ebers Papyrus, which was a medical textbook at a time, this comes. This could be written in a today's textbook of cardiology. If a man examines the if thou examinest the man for illness in his cardia, he has pains in his arms and in his breast and in one side of his cardia, it's death threatening him. And they even have a picture in a, in a medical article of this. It's hard to see, but this is supposedly the first picture ever of, a, of an Egyptian death from heart disease. You can see the sign of despair over here and the guy going down, and they're just assuming that's heart disease. But apparently a young guy died fairly suddenly, and it's, uh, it's probably what it is. Now, anyway, they used to, in rougher time, and even up to relatively recently, 15 or 20 years ago, they would autopsy mummies, but now they do it mainly by scanning. And this is Hatshepsut, who was a famous queen, who was riddled with diabetes, heart disease, all kinds of problems, and, when you, and she was obese. When you look at her, you see terrible teeth. You see, I mean, her statuary, that's when she was young. 
he's saying, stop, I've got to go on, I'm almost finished. This, uh, you had bad tooth disease in ancient Egypt, you had uh, children that had tooth loss. Uh, this is the characteristic look of Egyptian ground down teeth, and we'll see that as we plot along through this quickly. There you see it again, you can see these horrible uh, teeth that they had from eating all this bread and again and remember this is a thousand years before sugar came into existence Nobody knew about sugar. All they had was wheat. They had sticky carbs, but not sugar and now they do them here This is Lady Rye You can look at her. She died when she was in her 30s You can see where that arrow is that she had some vascular calcification uh, you can see she has some calcification in her heart wall and You can see here you can see carotid calcification uh, you can see calcification in the coronary arteries. This is, again, an Egyptian mummy eating the perfect diet to prevent heart disease. And when you look at this data on mummies, you find out that, that uh, mummies, the, the average that were 40 to 49 years old, 50% of them had atherosclerosis. So it was not rare in the Egyptian tissue eating a diet that had very little saturated fat. And so here's a paper that drives me nuts because these people came up and they look because people are doing these scans now and they're saying, hey, these people all had heart disease way back then. What's the deal? Well, this paper came out and it said, uh, the vast bibliography associated with the examination provides overwhelming evidence that heart disease was seen in a variety of vascular beds. Uh, it's clear they had vascular calcification and the ex explanation for these frequent pathological findings almost certainly resides in a diet rich in saturated fat. So. What they're saying, we know today that saturated fat causes heart disease. We know they had heart disease, so therefore they had to have eaten a lot of saturated fat. And so then their conclusion is there is unequivocal evidence to show that atherosclerosis is a disease of ancient times, true, induced by diet, true, it's not the diet they think, and that the epidemic of atherosclerosis, which began in the 20th century, is nothing more than history revisiting us. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. So. <clears throat> I'm almost through. So this inspired me to go back. I thought, you know, somebody must have done stable isotope analysis on Egyptians. What does that say? And when you go back and you look at that, you find out that, uh, that basically they ate a really a diet high in plant protein. I mean, the, 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 the uh, uh, dietary protein uh, contribution of animal protein was very small. And so that's what you found kind of throughout Egyptian uh, all these mummies. And they also found out in another study that it didn't matter whether they were rich people, poor people, middle-aged people, all social strata ate about the same thing and had the same stable isotope picture. So everybody ate this stuff and they got heart disease. And it wasn't that the rich people had saturated fat and they got mummified and therefore they got heart disease. So, so the diet of the subject was low protein, high carb, all classes ate the same diet, no evidence the wealthy ate more saturated fat. And so with that, I just want to say, if you look at this whole picture, you have the metabolic constraints, you have the stable isotope analysis, you've got the hunter versus farmer data, you've got the ancient Egyptian data, you've got the randomized control trials, there are probably 100 trials right now out there, probably more, but 100 at least, that, that randomized control trials showing that a low-carb diet is better than a low-fat diet, you add all, God, Mike, you dork, uh, I keep pushing the wrong button. You add all this together, and it all points to this, that the low-carb diet is what we cut our teeth on and probably what we should be eating right now. So I uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I, sorry I had to fly through this thing. <laughs> and now, whatever time left, I'll be happy to take questions. That got, was awesome. We've got five thank minutes. Um, here's the thing that's always been this debate on paleo. When it first started, I nicknamed it Phaleo because our ancestors didn't eat the way people are saying today. But when you look at the modern or the hunter-gatherer tribes that still survived, like when Weston A. Price looked and others, like the Inuit, you saw really good bone structure, really good health, very powerful, no cavities, but they didn't have longevity. And when I started to just find longevity, I found a group in the Caucasus Mountains that were getting over 110, and they still ate the meat but they added processed grains, but they hydrolyzed out the gluten through sourdoughing and stuff, so there's really no gluten left, there's lots of butter. So it looks like it was an adjunct, but it always seems like meat and animals should be the majority. And what I'm wondering, when people say low carb, I guess they couldn't tell, did they ferment it, did they sourdough it, 
Did they have other things like that? So based upon domestication of animals and things like that, do you think we can healthily use dairy and grains and sauerkrauts and things like that with our meats and maybe have the optimal of both? Because it's great to be strong, but it's great also to get huge longevity. So I wanted to get an idea what diet would you think would be most optimal for strength, health, teeth, and longevity? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. Many of these societies, the Inuit, for example, uh, all smoked heavily, and in fact, they encouraged their children, children to start smoking at age 10. The Inuits were big believers of not denying children the pleasures of adulthood. Uh -huh. So a lot of these societies smoke. So that, that's a, a confounder in a lot of this data. I, I did not know that. I would, uh, I would say, uh, just you know, personally, this is just off the top of my head. Sure. Uh, I would say that, well, let me back up for a minute. Stephen Austad, A-U-S-T-A-D, is, is a, a famous uh, longevity researcher. And if you look at his work, he shows through some uh, mathematical manipulation, uh, which makes it sound bad, but I'm through mathematics, let's say, that, that societies that were hunter-gatherer societies way back then that they've got a sufficient number of remains to evaluate uh, didn't have any shorter lives than we did. I mean, they lived as long as we did. I mean, they were prone to accidents, obviously. Uh, they were prone to infections. They had no antibiotics. But despite all that, they seemed to live as long as we did. And so my view on it is that I would limit the grains. I don't think dairy is a problem. Personally, I don't think dairy is a problem. I don't think some of the fermented things are problems. Uh, if you like them, I do best myself if I eat an all-meat diet. I mean, that's just the way I was telling somebody that at lunch today. I mean, I eat other stuff because I'm a weak-willed worm, and, <laughs> and I love to drink, so I do that too. I mean, not to excess, but I have a drink occasionally. Uh, but whenever I really want to get on the wagon and feel good, I just revert to a, a, an all-meat diet, and I always feel much better. And we've got a bunch of people stacking up. And last, so before we go, the, raw or cooked for meat, you think it makes a difference? I don't think so. Uh, I eat medium rare. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, raw, you need to chop it up so that you can chew it and it digests better if it's, you know, minced up. That's why they had those big teeth back then. Yeah. Yes. I get in a lot of arguments with uh, friends who are, uh, especially fruitarians mm -hmm. and vegetarians. I'm uh, <clears throat> curious if you know of any groups going back in history that did survive, that did have health and longevity that were fruitarian or even vegetarian. I don't think so because, I mean, not way back then because I don't think, you know, that they thought about that. I mean, they, uh, I mean, if you go way back, the chimpanzees, uh, they were fruitarians. They still are. I mean, they supplement a little bit of meat, but I can't think of a society that there's some modern hunter-gatherer societies that seem to live a long time. But whenever I get asked that question, which is also a question I get asked about the Asians, how do the Asians eat all this rice and they do this? It's, it's you know, my favorite philosopher is Frederick Bastiat, who was a, a French philosopher. And he said, you wrote this famous uh, essay, that which is seen and that which is not seen, and that which is seen is what everybody sees. They don't see that which is not seen. And that, is which not, that which is not seen is how these agrarian societies would do if they switched to a, an all-meat diet or a primarily meat diet. So we don't know the answer to that question. And the Japanese have the greatest long, longevity of any of the sort of industrialized people, and they also smoke the most. So does that mean smoking is good for you? You all ought to smoke because the Japanese do it and they live a lot longer? Anyway, next. Great presentation and great Thank review you. of the literature. Thank Definitely you. appreciate it. I want to play devil's advocate for a moment just to find out how you respond with um, presenting uh, three issues. Um, first of all, it could be argued that uh, evidence of cardiovascular disease in these mummy populations is evidence that those populations were living long enough to actually develop cardiovascular disease. So I'm curious, since it's difficult to actually estimate age from the cemetery bone populations, um, how, do, how would you address that question um, of whether or not that's not just evidence of potentially living longer? Second of all, I think that this, some of this evidence, assuming that indeed, indeed health did deteriorate um, with the shift to agriculture and assuming that that was related to diet, we could say, okay, we learned that monotonous diets based on very few plant-based foods are certainly detrimental to health. Then what about in the modern society where we have access to a plethora of plant-based foods that are rich in, in, in fats and proteins year-round? 
how do we, you know, are those necessarily as detrimental to health as the maybe all wheat-based diets with a few fruits and vegetables in the Neolithic early agricultural revolution time? And third, how do we address the epidemiological studies that um, demonstrate lower cardiovascular disease among vegetarian and vegan populations? Just curious what your responses would oh, be. Okay. Well, I'll start with the last one first. I mean, th there is some evidence that there's lower heart disease, but there's no le evidence that there's increased longevity. There's some papers out that show that uh, vegetarians do have a little bit of increased longevity, but vegetarians are, for the most part, more health-oriented people. They don't smoke, you know, they smoke less, they don't do risky things, they uh, don't drink a lot, they're more concerned about their health. They, uh, you know, there, there are famous studies that show that people who follow their doctor's advice do better even on placebo than people who don't follow their doctor's advice. And that confounds a lot of, of drug studies. So it's hard to say. I mean, if there were studies out that say on average vegetarians live 15 years longer, then I'd say, okay, there's something to this, but there aren't those studies. At least if there are, I don't know about them. So if it's true that they do have less heart disease and they don't live any longer, then they're trading one risk factor for the other. That's like statins. I mean, statins have been shown, except for a small population of people, have no increase in all, or no decrease in all-cause mortality. They definitely have a decrease in cardiac mortality. So what's happening is there, you take a statin, you pay $100 a month, and you trade one risk factor for another because you don't live longer. The name of the game is to live longer. And the, the other question is, is kind of was addressed in that slide that showed the different ages. You know, these mummies were 40 to 49, and 50% of them had heart disease, and the ones in the 30s, because you can't age them by their bones. And you can do it with skeletal remains, too. And that's how Osted did his work to show that people that lived back then live as long as they do now. It's, it's called, I can't remember the name, it's, it's like the eight-year doubling of, of mortality. And it's the same then, not very much different then than it is now. Um, and then uh, uh, your other question, what was your first one? That, that was my first one. I was curious about the, what your assessment would be of a oh, oh, just potentially a full, healthy vegetarian yeah, I mean, diet in... Uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, that, that you can make one. Do I think that a majority of people would be, do as well on that as, as would do on a, a healthy, healthful, low-carb diet? My opinion is no. But I'm sure that some people, you know, do okay. I mean, some vegetarians live to be ripe old ages. I mean, I think it's a, a function of the individual. But on a, on the the basis of prescribing it to masses of people, I wouldn't do it. Excellent responses. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted uh, to point that farming is often associated with exploitation, and even today. Um, so I wonder if that could be a confounder, that because farm farmers were exploited and were made to work too hard that their health deteriorated mm -hmm. as compared to the hunters. Because if I'm like a farmer in my own farm, uh, working on my plants, maybe on my animals, then maybe I wouldn't be as unhealthy. Uh, you know, that's a good point. I mean, I don't... Uh um, you know, I don't have any way to refute that, and I don't know that all farmers were exploited, but I'm sure some were. But, you know, the, so their stress levels, I'm sure, would be higher. Uh, and as we all know, stress leads to problems. But hunter-gatherer tribes were far from the peaceful, uh, you know, kumbaya folks that we think uh, they are. They were, uh, they were the thought, incredibly yeah. <laughs> into warring and killing one another and capturing one another and converting them to slaves and all that. Uh -huh. And so they had stressful lives too. So anyway, I don't know. It, it's true that farmers had much more arthritis, you know, in their shoulders and yeah. their elbows because they did all these repetitive things that hunter-gatherers didn't do. But aside from that, I, I don't have an answer. Okay, thank you. Good question. First thing I uh, wanna do is thank you for your book, Protein Power, which I read 12 years ago. No, and it you. totally changed my health. Good, well, thank you. Uh, my question is, is if you give these, uh, this talk in front of doctor's groups, what kind of reception do you receive? Uh, well, actually pretty good. Um, pretty good. I mean, it's, it's not, I know that 
everybody there is not on board. And I give I gave a different version of this talk to a lot of doctors groups about 10 years ago uh, that didn't have all the animations and all that, but had all the data. And they uh, they accepted it pretty well. I mean, here everybody pretty much knows this. I mean, everybody knows that the ancestral uh, diet is important, uh, and that if, if we try to find out what that is and follow it today, we're probably going to be healthier than if we don't. But a lot of them don't know that. They don't have any idea about that, and so it, it was a real eye opener to a lot of them. Uh, and I did, you know, I mean, they didn't have torches and pitchforks, but uh, I mean, I could see looks of on their faces out there, which I don't get a lot on these others. Any other? Sorry, just to follow up on that, could you comment on the China study? And <laughs> 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 are, you, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> How many people in here know what the China study is? Okay, everybody knows what the China study is. It was a giant epidemiological study. And as everybody should know, epidemiological studies have their purpose, and their purpose is to create hypotheses that can be tested with randomized control tiles, trials. I, epidemiological studies themselves don't mean squat. Uh, and if you look at these things, you know, the scientists use uh, P factors to determine what's statistically significant and what's not, and they usually use the 95th percentile. And if you look at these epidemiological studies, I think he did something like 7,000 of them in there, and five, you know, 5% of 7,000 is whatever that is, that's, uh, what is that? Uh, 5% of 7 to 10%, 7,000, no, 700, so 350 of them, 350 of them you would expect just by the way the whole system works to be flawed, uh, I guess is a good way to put it. So uh, it, they, it doesn't prove anything, and he kind of picked and chose, and if you're interested, I wrote a long, long blog post about that. You, if you want to go to proteinpower.com and go to this, the nav bar and find my blog You can and look up the China study, you can read it because I went to great lengths to, to talk about that. All right, well listen, thank you, I've ran over and I'm sorry, I, and I appreciate your attention.